This is an angiogram done at an outside institution. I want you to look at it and tell me what's wrong. Can someone tell me what's the immediate next step? So what's the diagnosis and what's the next step? The huge issue in this angiogram, there is massive myocardial blush. What you see here, this is contrast staining the muscle, the myocardium. And this reflects what? Why are you getting blushing of that myocardium? Basically, this is an injection with a catheter that is occluding the vessel where the hemodynamic probably do show damping or ventricularization. I have no access to their hemodynamics. But just looking at this picture, I'll tell you, this catheter is occluding the vessel. The catheter is bigger than the ostium. It is therefore occluding the vessel. Okay, and you're having damping or ventricularization on your hemodynamics. And this is what happens when you inject with a catheter that is occlusive, the contrast will stain inside the vessel. It will hang inside the vessel. Then eventually it will stain inside the myocardium. This contrast is not clearing. It will sit around in the vessel. It will sit around in the myocardium. It will not get cleared by blood. And this is an emergency. You see that angiogram, my immediate reaction is to pull out that catheter. They didn't have the right reaction because they kept taking picture and look at that. More myocardial stain. And those are the three steps here. So one, you're occlusive with your catheter, you get damping or ventricularization. The second thing you get is dye stain in the vessel and in the myocardium. What's the third thing that will happen after myocardial stain? In the next few seconds, what, what will this patient have if you don't disengage your catheter? Ventricular fibrillation. So that's why when I see this, I jump on the catheter, I pull it out. You have one or two seconds before he goes into VFib. So this is what he had. Normally, we have our catheter in a big osteum larger than the catheter. In this case, you will have a normal aortic pressure on the hemodynamics. But if you're in a small osteum, you get damping where the pressure becomes flat like this, maybe even flatter. Or if you're not fully occlusive, but somewhat occlusive, you get what we call ventricularization, meaning the pressure looks like this, like a ventricular pressure. Why? Because your wedge and your catheter now is seeing the downstream myocardium which you will stain if you inject without disengaging your catheter. It's not a perfect LV pressure because some aortic pressure keeps it swirling around. It's like doing, again, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, okay? You wedge it, you see the LA pressure downstream, okay? Normally, when you engage, the pressure shouldn't change much. It should stay in aortic pressure, down sloping in diastole with dicrotic notch. But here, when we engage, we got this pressure tracing, what we call ventricularized. It's rectangular, upsloping in diastole and with an A wave, okay? Now there are various degrees of ventricularization. This is a subtle form. This is a blatant form, but this is a subtle form of ventricularization. I can tell it's ventricularized because it's sometimes horizontal in diastole with an A wave. You don't see diacritic notch here. You see a notch here, which is actually a subtle A wave. It implies you have a small osteum or osteal disease or osteal spasm. We see that, for example, even if you don't have disease, if you engage a normal conus, which is a small branch, if your catheter goes into the conus branch and you inject, you will have the same issue. You will have damping and ventricularization and you can progress through myocardial stain of the RVOT that the conus supplies, then VFib. But the idea is whatever it is, it could be the true right or the corners. Whenever you see this, it's a small osseum, osseal disease or osseal spasm. So what should you do in these cases? How do you do an angiogram? So let's say here the operator recognized that issue. He saw he's damped. He didn't inject. So what, how should he do his angiogram? You can consider smaller catheter. The better answer in this case, the best answer is you disengage, 
and you try to be barely disengaged, barely non-selective. Basically, you make your catheter slightly disengaged. So you're not fully engaged, your catheter is in the neighborhood, okay? This is from another case we did. The catheter pressure was damped, as in here. So we counterclock the catheter and we progressively disengaged it with a counterclock maneuver and we went from damped to ventricularized here. This is ventricularized because the pressure between the peaks is horizontal, it's flat. So we progress from damp to ventricularized to a more normal arterial waveform here. Then we inject in a barely disengaged position with a normal waveform. So you try to be barely disengaged and you watch your hemodynamics, you make sure they are not ventricularized or damp. So that's the best answer, whether for the left or right coronary. And this is another case where we were ventricularized, engaging the left main. So we did our angiogram with a good waveform while being barely disengaged. You see this? We are disengaged here. That's why you're seeing a lot of the cusp. But we are close to engaged, so we're able to see the vessel. And I explain in one of the talks that how can you be barely disengaged? Sometimes you try to be something like this, but the catheter will fly out. You cannot maintain that subtle position, that fine position of barely engaged, barely disengaged. So what you can do in this case is uh, you can get a guiding catheter, wire the coronary, then disengage the guide. The coronary wire will grab your guide so much so that you can maintain a barely disengaged position with the wire stabilizing the guide. So that's the best answer, be barely disengaged. In cases, occasionally what I do, I do something like they did, but I fly it out immediately. So I inject one millimeter and I pull it out as I'm injecting. I disengage as I'm injecting. That's what we call the hit and run technique. So I give the blood time to come in and clear that contrast and not stay in the myocardium. And here I want to provide you with an illustration of the technique I described earlier of engaging and using a wire to stabilize the catheter. So you use a guiding catheter and before you engage, you have a wire ready to go inside it while still disengaged. You engage and you will see the pressure damping but do not inject contrast. While engaged and damp, quickly wire without contrast. Then after you wire, you slightly disengage the guide until you eliminate that pressure damping or ventricularization. The wire here will prevent the guide from flying out. And then that wire will help you maintain that slightly disengaged stable position. And this is what I call the hit and run wiring then imaging. Now I want to move on to another scenario, the specific case of an RCA catheter that is pointing up. Whenever you see an RCA catheter pointing up, you know that this catheter is in the conus branch and that's why you get pressure ventricularization or damping. So there are special maneuvers for that particular situation. You know you're in conus branch, you're wedging the conus branch, that's why you're damp. So in this case, you focus on getting in the true right. You can just tell by the shape. Memorize, when you see this shape with damping, you're in the conus branch. That doesn't imply small right or osteo right disease. That implies you're in the conus. So in those cases, again, I would counter clock to disengage, then clock to engage while putting more of a pulling tension on the catheter as I'm engaging, more than I did the first engagement to elongate that catheter and make it point down toward the true right. The conus points up and it is more anterior. So I engage by more clock and more pull to make it point down and more posteriorly. You can also get a catheter that points down. Instead of JR4, AR1 points more down than JR4. You can also get RCB catheter which points down. And this is a summary slide of all the scenarios during which damping or ventricularization occur and how to manage them. 
One, RCA engagement with catheter tip pointing up. This is selective conus engagement. You may counterclock to disengage, go back down to the valve, then attempt to engage the RCA with more pull and more clock to aim more posteriorly and make the catheter point more down toward the RCA. Number two, you have damping in left coronary engagement or in RCA engagement, but with the catheter tip pointing horizontally or down. In this case, you suspect that the right or left coronary ostium is narrow, small, or vasospastic. Administer or intracoronary or sublingual nitroglycerin, then four potential technique. One, try to barely disengage the catheter and be barely non-selective. Slight counterclock for RCA, slight pull for the left coronary. Improve the pressure and be close enough to the ostium to obtain good non-selective images. And particularly in interventions, consider using a shorter tip catheter to prevent deep engagement. That's why for ostium left main PCI, we use a Jutkins guide rather than the deep EBU guide. B, if the barely disengaged position is not possible and the catheter keeps flying out upon disengagement, in this case, you use that technique of hit and run wiring with a guiding catheter and quick wiring while damped, then you disengage the catheter barely and the wire stabilizes you, then you can obtain your angiography. C, you can do the hit and run, not wiring, hit and run injection. Especially in the right coronary artery, you can inject one milliliter as you're withdrawing the catheter and this way you can obtain an image with less risk. This is not the preferred technique. And number D, if ventricularization is very mild, then you can consider taking a couple of images while ventricularized. I would suggest generally against that, except in rare situations, such as when coronary engagement has been difficult and you don't want to keep disengaging and re-engaging as repetitive engagement of a coronary that is osteally diseased by itself will create a risk of dissection and complications. So you may accept the risk of taking a couple of pictures while mild ventricularized in those particular cases. Number three, during PCI, ventricularization often occurs when the guiding catheter is too deeply engaged. Even if the ostium is not particularly narrow, you may get off and on ventricularization from deep guiding catheter engagement. In this case, what you need to do is to slightly disengage with pullback and frequently some torque, for example, counterclock for the RCA. In those patients, that slightly disengaged position may need to be stabilized with double wiring, especially if you're doing a slightly complex intervention, you're pushing stents and devices, a slightly disengaged position may not be enough, so you need double wiring here to stabilize the guide during your complex maneuvering. I want to provide a note regarding side hole catheter and its value or more so its lack thereof. Side hole catheter is a catheter that has holes beside the tip. When you're damped or ventricularized, those side holes will allow shunting of blood from the aorta and the coronary. So they will provide some flow to the coronary. So in theory, it, you may think it's useful because it's preventing ischemia. It does definitely prevent contrast stain to a degree at least. I do want to focus on the caveat of this side hole catheters, okay? First caveat is that they, those tiny holes provide marginal flow to the coronary, few percentage of flow, and does not significantly or markedly attenuate ischemia. So you will still be ischemic. Two, it makes ventricularization and damping improve, not because you're improving ischemia in the coronary and flow in the coronary, but partly because you're getting transmission from those side holes. So you're getting a contaminated pressure. So you're not just seeing pressure at the tip, coronary pressure, you're seeing aortic pressure. So it gives you false reassurance, which I absolutely hate. It's a false sense of security. Third problem with the side hole catheter is that they have no role in diagnostic catheters because in diagnostic uh, procedure, you're just sitting briefly. You're just doing quick injections. It may have values in cases where your catheter is sitting for a prolonged period of time, such as during intervention, for a prolonged period of time between injections. 
not just doing injections. So this is where you may use it in interventions. Don't use it in diagnostic. But even in interventions, keep in mind the caveat I just described and keep in mind the fourth and last caveat here, which is you should never, for interventional fellows, never, never use sidehole catheter in left main intervention, okay? You do not want to have left main ischemia for any period, and you definitely don't want to mask left main ischemia with side holes. In left main osteal disease or small left main that is damping, just you have to intervene with a slight disengagement. It's painful, but that's how you do it. Slight disengagement, and you get your support via having one or two wires to grab that guide from outside the aorta without it flying out and without you being engaged. So be disengaged, couple of wires, and do not use side holes in, in left main. You can use side holes in mid to distal RCA intervention with moderate osseal disease, simply because I can afford to have a false sense of security in RCA intervention. I can afford having RCA ischemia in a patient who already has RCA disease, but left main ischemia, the patient will have PEA arrest by the end of the case if you're using side holes and not paying attention that the side holes are fooling you, okay? So don't use it. In RCA, again, I use it in mid to distal RCA intervention. I don't use it in osseal RCA, simply because in osseal RCA, I have to anyway, during my maneuvering, keep the guide in and out, okay? I have to keep engaging and disengaging throughout my stenting and ballooning. So no point of using a side wall. Actually, I like ventricularization and osseal interventions because it tells me when I'm in and it tells me when I'm out without having to use contrast. Those are the four caveats. This is a summary slides of whatever I just uh, described. Uh, I'll let you read it when you review this.